everybody to our ninth edition of Tea Time presented by the Streamate Network. My name is Vanessa Eve and I will be your host today. I'm the new director of community relations for the Streamate Network. And today we are changing up our formatting a little bit since the U.S. Thanksgiving holiday happens to coincide with our usually scheduled uh, tea time date, which is the last Thursday of each month, then we're just pre-recording this month's discussion. So if you're watching it, obviously it's not live. Today's topic is how our familial culture influences our views on mental health. Joining us for today's discussion are our guests. We have Devin Deshay and Steph Sia. So let's take a moment to go around and introduce yourselves. So can you share a little bit about who you are and what you do? Devin, let's throw it to you first. Absolutely. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am a sex and relationship therapist, as well as a P PhD candidate um, advocating and doing research for individuals within the sex worker and adult industry. Um, I'm also an educator. I'm a college professor at Miami Dade, where I teach um, intro to psych and human growth and development. Um, so obviously super stoked to be part of this conversation. I feel that it is mandatory. I feel that it is important. I am a huge advocate for mental health, especially across cultures and for people of color. So really appreciate you being here and can't wait to dive into the material with you. Yes. Formidable uh, resume there too, Devin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Very, I'm very glad you're here. Uh, Steph, <laughs> how about you? Sure. Um, my name is Steph Sia. I am a digital content creator. I'm also a dancer here based in Vancouver, Canada. And I am also the host of the Sex Worker podcast, Stripped by Sia. And like Devin, I'm really excited to kind of dive into today's conversations because my podcast is all about destigmatizing sex work, really humanizing sex workers, and also just we, we dive into a lot of these conversations on the show too. I mean, there's so many intersecting layers. Um, our family really can have a huge effect on our mental well-being, our how we conduct our, our way of life, our business and whatnot. So I really can't wait to kind of dig deeper on this very topic. So thank you. Yes, thank you, Steph. And I feel like with both of you in our separate conversations, this very topic inadvertently came up somehow, like we were just talking and yeah, uh, Steph, uh -huh. I know you and I too, um, have kind of dug deep into this more recently. Um, so whenever we think about this time of year, obviously, we're getting into the holidays, and there's so much that's centered around family and tradition and some of our family customs, um, you know, it really got me to thinking about also as for me personally, as a mom, this is also a very um, demanding time of year on mm -hmm. our energy, whether it's physically or emotionally. Um, and that's something that got me to thinking about mental health and really what the dialogue was around that um, you know, growing up in, in my household. So can you guys describe what the family dynamics were like when you were growing up, like what your parents were like, and uh, were you guys like a tight-knit group with your extended family and so forth? I can start. Um, I grew up Southern Baptist in a little country town called Booth, Texas. Um, so our family dynamic was very much tethered within the church and within religion. Um, you know, I had one of those praying grandmas who kind of oversee and um, dictate the, pretty much the whole dynamic of things. And um, I was raised by a single mom at the time as well. So it was really just, you know, my grandma and my mom raising me um, mostly more than anyone. And I think that's the reason why there was kind of the distance there with the, between the immediate and extended family. Um, I'm not sure if my mom was kind of battling with any guilt or shame, but um, her straying away from them ultimately led to me straying as well. So there was always that kind of distance there. Um, and mental health to this day um, was not existent. It wasn't a conversation. Um, the fact that I'm a therapist, they, they don't understand it. They feel like, you know, oh, you work with crazy people are, oh, those people must really be sick. And it's like, really? 
not the case. You know, a lot of my clients are actually very well and wanting to maintain stability. So um, still a lot of neg- negative t- negativity there and how they view my work in general. Um, but growing up, yeah, we didn't talk about our feelings. There wasn't any temperature checks or, you know, mood boards or anything. So, um, and I think that's common, unfortunately, for a lot of African-American households. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do you think that, especially when you go home, like, you know, during the holidays and whatnot, do you ever get the feeling like people think you're psychoanalyzing them or <laughs> just, out, <laughs> just out of curiosity. <laughs> absolutely. It's to the point where I don't even know because everything I say, and even if I'm not intentionally, you know, trying to put on the therapy hat, it's just, you know, it's going to be insightful. It's going to be, make you think it's going to be something of substance. You know, I don't like the small talk. I don't like the, I know we want to house work and how's that? No, I really want to know how have we healed since we last spoke type of thing. So yeah, I just try to just enjoy the moment and not say too much because they feel like it's a therapy session every time I open my mouth. So <laughs> uh, Steph, what about you with your family and, and those dynamics? What were, what was it like growing up? Yeah, uh, I know we've had like a previous conversation about our family families because like you, Vanessa, I grew up here in the, well, I grew up in the West coast. So I grew up here, um, in a small town called Coquitlam and I grew up in a family of, you know, Filipino, mostly Filipino (laughs) background. And of course with in, in Filipino culture, it's largely rooted with Catholicism. So lots of the religion dictating kind of family values, how we, like how we, I guess, present ourselves and whatnot. So it was really interesting because I feel like I grew up a little bit sheltered and I didn't really know much outside of a Catholic kind of sphere until I got to university. So um, in that kind of aspect, you know, it was uh, limited uh, in certain ways, also maybe restricted, also maybe like a little bit willfully blind in certain aspects. And on the topic of mental health or mental well-being, that kind of conversation <laughs> didn't really ever exist. Um, I also want to say that I grew up mainly in an authoritative type of uh, like parental relationship. So, um, and I feel like this happens in a lot of Asian families where, you know, there is a very distinct hierarchy of I am the parent and you are the child and you have to do as I say. And mm-hmm. that actually being real reasons and excuses and cop outs that, you know, when we got into heated arguments, that would be like, uh, I am, I am the parent and you need to listen to me. So a lot of that. And even to this day, trying to talk to my mother about like what mental health is very, very hard for them to understand what that is or for them to take it seriously. Mm-hmm. So it's challenging growing up. Do you feel like at this point in your life, now that you're an adult, is that kind of authoritative dynamic still there? Like whenever you do maybe have more heartfelt or open conversations with your parents, um, has that changed at all? by this point? Yeah, I feel like honestly, it has over the past like two years. So in very recent times, uh, and that's just was me trying to have an active effort in trying to explain and educate, uh, at least to my mom, what this means, um, and like why this is important and why we need to talk about it and why you need to take this a bit more seriously. Um, but before then, like, honestly, prior, like from like 2019 and before it still was very much taboo. And again, them not really understanding what this is, what this means, um, how this can actually take a toll on your your physical self, your emotional well being, and whatnot. So it's a work in progress. So where do you think that your parents got this, um, got their ideals and beliefs from? Do you think that this was the way that they too were raised and it was just passed down from generations? I definitely feel it's generational. Um, the more I grow and kind of just be a witness and observe the dynamics of my mom and her mom and my dad and um, his mom, it's, it's just very clear like, oh, that's her. It's not you. Mm-hmm. You, you begin to disconnect the two and um, then realize to have more grace, like, okay, 
my mom treated me this way because that's how she was treated. Um, so I definitely think that there's an influence through their parents that's passed down. And, you know, I, I'm a new, newly parent as well. So I'm just trying to be extra cautious and conscious of what I'm passing down that I got from my mom. And I don't think that conversation, you know, they don't teach you that in the, the parenting books and the how to raise a child. But, but I think people should really, really take a deeper look at how their parents were raised ask questions about that because that's where the root of it all really is. And even, you know, if you're, you're blessed enough to have a great grand, you know, really expand the conversation because I absolutely believe that that's all influence and that's where everybody's getting everything from. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Tiffany Aliche. She's more of a financial persona that's out there. And just like with what you were speaking of, like it, that it's generational, um, passing things down. Um, she was talking about it in terms of even money. So it seems like mm -hmm. just the things that happen to you and even the energy that you were raised with can easily be passed down unless we decide to, you know, shake things up from how our parents and their parents did things. Absolutely. And I love that you said that because they're even doing studies now on epigenetics, which is like the cellular level of things. Oh, and they're looking yeah, wow. at the um, Holocaust survivors, children who were born well after the event, who are experiencing like low cortisol, stress, anxiety. Um, so yeah, energetically, it's passed on genetically, yeah. physically, emotionally. It, it runs really deep. I feel like our generation nowadays we are challenging things in terms of like, we are asking questions and we're like, well, why has this been done so many times and why hasn't this been changed? Because very much uh, my, my family, like my parents have been influenced by like my grandpa, my grandpa on both sides and, and like going down that line as well. But um, it really wasn't in the culture, or at least not in the times to, you know, talk back to your parents or challenge what they're trying to say. Or again, this is just like, this is how it's been done. And this is just the way it's going to be done forever. But I feel like with generations now, people are starting to question and be like stronger and more active critical thinkers to be like, actually, hang on a second, like this might not be right. And why do we keep doing things a certain way? So I feel like, yes, generationally, that is definitely has a, has a lot of influence for sure. But I also feel like, you know, there's a lot more openness with how people are perceiving um, this now, nowadays. Which is revolutionary. Mm -hmm. It's no little thing when I have clients who say, okay, I told my dad, no, or I, you know, as adults too, like you would think we're still, you know, in high school, but this stuff carries. But when they, when they challenge and they question and they say, wait, wait a minute. And they just are a living embodiment of going against these rules and generational things that we don't know where it came from. Mm -hmm. That's how the world changes. Mm -hmm. And I'm with you on that. I'm so proud of the generation now and the ones to come that are like, you know what? Fuck that. Sorry, I don't know if we're allowed to. No, I think we're also living in kind of an exceptional moment in the world right now because mm -hmm. of there's such a divide, even generationally, it seems, that now if you challenge or if you give a little bit of pushback, even to your parents and whether wh whatever your intentions are, you know, it's almost like you're labeled as I hate this word, but like woke. And it's like, what is this? You know, <laughs> And it's almost like we are the ignorant ones, which can be super frustrating. And it's mm -hmm. almost like daunting to even go there. Respect is a word that I heard a lot growing up, mm -hmm. like from your parents, you know, show them respect and Filipino household as well over here. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I even trying to have conversations with my own parents, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's very, very difficult. Um, and so you're kind of made to feel like, well, you're being disrespectful by going against the protocol. Mm -hmm. And it makes you wonder why that's in place. Why don't they want us to talk back? Like I get the respect thing, but I really think there's something deeper, like yeah. what will happen if we 
just challenge and tap into the things that you're trying to stray us away from. <laughs> for me, once I started doing that, I, I got closer to myself, yeah. my higher calling, my purpose, and not one that was assigned or passed down or that I was born into, which is super liberating. Mm -hmm. So the why behind it as well is super important because there's always a form of oppression in, in, in the sense, even if it's unintentional. I guess you'll never know until you, even about yourself, until you actually go there. So let's dig in a little bit deeper into the actual dialogue surrounding mental health and in your, in your uh, childhood homes. Did your parents ever really talk to you guys about mental health? It doesn't necessarily need to be in the context of, you know, this is what mental health is and we should be aware of it, et cetera. Um, but like, were there any challenging times, for instance, that your parents helped you through where they maybe were a little bit more attuned to how you were doing emotionally, mentally? Um, what, what was that dialogue like? Gosh, <laughs> these conversations never existed in my household at all. Mm -hmm. And like, I mean, not just talking about like, you know, stuff about like now in terms of like toxic workplaces and stuff like that. But like, I'm talking about like when I was 13 and like severely depressed and me trying to talk to my mom. And I remember watching um, the movie 13 when that came out too. Oh, that movie. <laughs> that that movie. movie was intense. <laughs> it was really intense. Very much so. <laughs> <laughs> but like Evan Rachel Wood was in it. And then I remember like, I think she was a character. Yeah, she was a character that was influenced by Nikki Reed. But also she was going through some depressive um, times as well. And she started cutting herself. And, you know, I was kind of like, living a parallel kind of life. And I was trying to tell my mom, like, I'm struggling here. And I was trying to show her the movie somehow to like get to her to be like, hey, help me. But uh -huh. then I never got any kind of reciprocation. Um, it was just like, just stonewalled. And I feel like maybe she just didn't know how to deal with that too. Like mm -hmm. retrospectively thinking about this now, just like, I don't think she of has ever had those conversations with her parents and stuff too, like what we were saying earlier. So um, yeah, these conversations uh, were pretty much non-existent during this time. And, and even like within my own family with my sister, her also going through like depression as well during high school and her trying to talk to my mom about it. And it was just like, they didn't know how to deal. So mm -hmm. yeah. It's your mom. They can probably, she lives with you. She can probably sense that you know, you're not doing too well, but how did that make you feel whenever you didn't get what you needed? Yeah, it was really hard. I felt really alone, uh, completely isolated. I didn't know if I had any other friends at that age that were also going through the same thing, because of course it's like, there's a facade and no one ever shows that you just, it's like, you just put on your happy face or like, it's like Instagram. You just see the good part, but you don't see like what's happening behind closed doors or behind the screen and mm -hmm. stuff too. So it was really hard. And like, I, I couldn't talk to my dad either because like my dad's just like one of those alpha male guys <laughs> and mm -hmm. feelings don't exist. And there's no such thing as emotion. And then with the large age gaps with my siblings, it just felt like I was, I had no one to talk to and they couldn't relate to me either. So I just felt really trapped and alone and just like alone with my own feelings and whatnot. So um, I really just turned to my friends at that point in my life. Unfortunately, my story is very much similar. Um, I had a whole emo goth phase and <laughs> looking back, I'm just, they were all cries for help just attention, just inner child now is, you know, able to admit it was just love me, see me, hear me. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, I don't know, you know, if it was discomfort or just not knowing how to have those conversations. And again, echoing, you know, my mom not having those conversations with her mom. Um, but yeah, it was, it was just very avoidant, very, if we did talk about it, it was minimized. You know, you're just an emotional teenager. You're just, you know, having a day. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, that is a story I hear from a lot of different people. And it makes you wonder what kind of world <laughs> that's been created as a result. Do you think that the way that you handled those kinds of difficult moments in your life 
were they kind of reflections of how you saw your parents handling difficult situations in their life? I think so, but in different ways. So it's interesting that you bring that up because, you know, generational trauma, part of it is picking up the maladaptive behaviors and patterns that our parents showcase because it's all we saw, it's all we know, you know, unless we're watching 13 or movies and, <laughs> you know, social media and things of that nature too. But the core influences from our parents' behaviors so, you know, my mom may not have had the all black and the eyeliner and everything, but she probably would withdraw. She probably would not talk to family or friends for weeks. And I would witness that mm -hmm. and I would replicate that in my own way, but absolutely pass down, absolutely things we pick up from them. But again, from generation to generation, it just might look different, but it's the same patterns, the same narratives, the same behaviors. I feel like I had like a different response like mm -hmm. because I was so like not shunned but I just didn't I get the, I didn't get the love I didn't get the support that I needed at that time it just like caused a determined that like I never want to be like that when I have mm -hmm. kids and I, I don't have kids yet but like I just like mentally put that in my head and I just didn't want to be a parent like that, that, you know, like I want to be able to, I want to be able to be the person or the resource that my kids can come to. Mm -hmm. And, um, again, akin to like the authoritative type of parenting, like that, again, that they had that really distinct separation that like, no, you actually can't <laughs> come to me or that's how, at least how I received it. So mm -hmm. for me, that just kind of like, made me even more rebellious in a sense. Uh, Devin, you mentioned that your mom was also a single mom when you were growing up. And um, like, I, I, I got married this past March, but prior to that, I was a single mom for nine years. So since the kids were really, really young, I think my youngest daughter was about three, maybe two. Um, you know, there would be really hard challenging times. And I remember even when the kids were younger, just like going upstairs and like closing the door so that mm -hmm. no one can see me weeping. Um, but I felt, I felt like I, I really tried to, uh, what's the word, just hide, just hide it a lot from yeah. them, even though they're young, even though they don't know what's going on. But, you know, when we talk about like, um, <laughs> passing things on to our kids, I kind of wonder if, if that, um, you know, that energy is being passed down. But, you know, do you feel that your mom, um, did you kind of get a sense ever that she struggled at all, like as a solo parent? Never in the moment. But now that I'm older and dealing with, you know, doing inner child work and <laughs> in therapy myself, um, you get glimpses of it. Like it starts to flashbacks start to come. And now I'm witnessing it in another light. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're a child, from that perspective, I don't necessarily think you're aware, but you, you may feel the energy of it. You may feel the emotion of it, um, but it doesn't really get put together until you start to, you know, come into adulthood and look back on it, mm -hmm. um, which is why I, I can show a little bit more grace. You know, I can say, oh, she was avoidant, but maybe she worked double shifts and just got home and needed to shut the door and just take a moment for herself or oh she was being you know short with me maybe she you know was just exhausted of, of catering to me 24 7 and doing work and like not leaving any room or, or filling her cup up at all so um yeah it's different if you would have asked my, my my younger self I probably wouldn't have noticed but now that I'm older um, I look back and maybe could connect some dots, but it doesn't make me resent or, you know, have any negative feelings. It just makes me more, you know, graceful and understanding of our situation. Do you guys feel like there are, like culturally, do you feel that there are beliefs regarding mental health? Do you, did you see these same beliefs kind of manifest throughout your family while you were growing up? Well, for in African-American homes, it's just a lot of, and I don't know if it's the same um, from y'all's experience, a lot of pray about it. A lot of um, give it to God, pray about it. Um, we don't talk. It just wasn't a conversation. It was between you and God. 
which, you know, I'm a prayer. I, I, I still practice that, um, that realm of spirituality, but you know, you can't pray for a husband and then stay in the house. You have, there's work to do on earth. There's physical things that you need to do. You can't pray for, you know, a better job and not submit resumes and do go on interviews and things of that nature. So, you know, you can't pray for better mental health and just, there's work to be done. And I think that just wasn't understood back then. And even currently, they still are very much kind of take that stance on it. And I think it's, again, just because they're uncomfortable to have that conversation. They don't feel like they could be a safe space to invite people to share things that they need in regards to mental health. Um, so that's still kind of the go-to statement that they utilize, at least within my <laughs> course. <laughs> that's a tough one to contend against, too, or to really give any kind of pushback, because then it's like, oh, okay, so you're thinking uh, yeah. then that your therapy is more powerful than, you know, than God or Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> I do not see that going over too well at the dinner table, especially, but. Oh, yeah, they, it, it gets intense. And, you know, not saying that I can do more than God or anything, but it helps to try all avenues. Like, why just that? And then end of conversation. Does that mean I can't talk to you about it? Is this not a safe space? So it's an interesting concept that, you know, I'm sure they mean well and are very intentional in saying that. But is it in another way to avoid and, you know, defeat some discomfort too? Like, what is it really about? That's really interesting. I mean, <laughs> again, I just feel like my parents didn't know how to have those conversations and didn't know where to start. Mm -hmm. And um, if you didn't know, I also work as a marketing consultant on the side for a sexual health educator. And we kind of kickstart these conversations with kids early on so that they can go to their parents as their trusted resource and stuff too. Um, but we never had, like, I my parents never had any kind of like training like that when they were growing up and I feel with my mom, like she doesn't like these con confrontational type of conversations. She actually gets really defensive. Um, but also like you, Devin, um, go ask God for help would always be a cop out type of answer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she didn't, would you want to know what to say? That's more of like the cue to like shut it down now kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Yeah. What do you say to that? Okay. I guess I'll go pray about it. You know, and again, not to knock it. I mean, I right. No. Know, but <laughs> it's that, that definitely came up in conversations with my mom as well. Mm -hmm. My dad passed last year. And so naturally as the child, you know, you're worried about their state of their mental state and she lives alone now too. And, you know, I'm like, she started expressing things and I'm like, mom, you really should probably go talk to somebody, you know, mm -hmm. at least just for the release. And she was like, that's okay. I've got God. So kind of the same thing. Like, what do you, what do you say to, you just really can't. So that's pretty much the, the end of that conversation typically. But if we want to learn, if we want to grow, if we want to evolve, I invite, if somebody does give you like that little blanket statement, call it out. Like, okay, I'm going to go do that. But, you know, what would it look like if we were to continue the conversation in spite of that remark that you just made, mm -hmm. you know, just to take it another level, you know, it's just something I'm suggesting or else we're going to stay in this loop and then we're not talking about it. And then, you know, we just keep praying about it and nothing ever gets discussed. Mm -hmm. Cause I had a similar situation. My, my grandpa passed. I was so worried about my grandma, you know, grandma, I'm a therapist. It doesn't have to be through me, but I know the works that just talking to someone can do. It's powerful. You need this. Oh, I'll talk to God. Mm -hmm. And to this day, I truly don't believe she's healed. Culturally, what is it about therapists or therapy that you think is so daunting to people? Like, do you think that, I, I think it's also been stigmatized widely, but that it's kind of a 
like an admission of guilt or something that there's something wrong with you if you go to mm -hmm. therapy? Like what, what is it? Especially Devin in your situation, being in the therapist chair, um, mm -hmm. you know, what are some of the, the things that you've heard? I just hear the most that people are surprised to be working with someone like me. When especially people of color come to me, they're like, oh, I was expecting an old white male, you know, with, with his little notebook, writing judgments and things. And they're not understanding that therapy has evolved. Therapists. There's therapists of color. There's non-binary therapists. There's therapists who specialize in sex workers, who specialize in individuals who identify as queer. It, it, it's an infinite um, list of possibilities. And a lot of people are not aware of that. They're still stuck in that very much, you know, Freud era where, you know, this, this white guy is just analyzing you when that's not the case. And there is, of course, like you're saying too, that feeling of being judged or being shamed, but a successful good therapist will see you and hear you. And that, that'll be the last thing that you'll feel. You know, this is your space. This is your time you know, I'm not here to judge. I'm here to accept and listen. People don't know that until they come. So it, it's just really unfortunate that, you know, unless we have more talks like this, that just normalizes, educates, and gives a realistic glimpse of how it is, then it's going to continue to be a problem. I think on my end, or like at least when I was younger, the inaccessibility of finding a therapist, like the cost, mm -hmm. um, was like a major detractor for me when I was younger um, because I couldn't afford it. So that was really hard. Um, also like the vulnerability uh, or the fear of being vulnerable. Like I've, I just feel like people are just not ready to open mm -hmm. up or maybe they're just ready to open up, but they're not ready to hear the feedback and not, <laughs> yeah, not ready to hear the critique um, or that they might be the ones at fault. Um, those can be really scary truth for some people that they might not be ready. So those are kind of a couple things that I've experienced in my, in my own kind of therapy journey. And also just like not finding the right therapist that is a good fit. Um, so I've definitely gone through a couple of therapists and the first one didn't really work out because I just felt like I wasn't being heard and I didn't feel really <laughs> comfortable. And, and I was like, I left, feeling like more confused or mm -hmm. more hurt too. So it's, it's definitely a journey um, that takes a bit of work. Mm -hmm. I tell people it's like dating. You don't just, <laughs> <laughs> yes. you know, it's a relationship that you're going to build with this person that you're going to be vulnerable with, that you're going to want to feel safe with. So there's no, if you do not feel comfortable with the therapist you know, I get availability, accessibility, costs, insurance, all that is a factor, but don't fork because you could do more trauma into yourself with that dynamic. So shop around, you know, date around, do those consultations if they have some, even if you have to pay a tiny fee, because it has to be a good fit. This might just be the case in Washington state, but there seems to be a lot of like sliding scale options mm -hmm. as well, right? And uh, even within the sex work community, there's resources specifically for sex workers. So, um, you know, just talking about finding the right therapist that you can also identify with. It, it seems like there's a lot more out there, I guess, than maybe there was before. It, and just everything being lumped into just therapy in general. Definitely. Yeah, the fact that um, Pineapple Support is, you know, offering them subsidized therapy and support and resources and groups galore um, was surprising to me because I've been in the field maybe six years now, and that wouldn't, that didn't exist before last year. Right. It wasn't a thing. Um, so slowly but surely there's more happening, and I think California gave benefits to sex workers and they took it away or I'm not, I'm not yeah. sure the follow-up with that, but at least that's on the radar. At least we're having conversations about it. It's on the voting bill at least. Mm -hmm. Especially the pandemic. And there was so much emphasis on, you know, we need to really be aware of our mental health and, you know, work-life balance. And, you know, we, we, I think we heard a lot and we saw a lot of that messaging, um, 
during the pandemic. But do you think that that is something that will stay? One, and two, do you think that that messaging also reached other generations where this wasn't therapy and mental health awareness wasn't necessarily a normal thing? I think it's here to stay, um, like along with like other things that came out during the pandemic, like from like working from home and whatnot. I think it is going to be one of those conversations that we are going to continue having. Um, There has just been a lot more amplification on like um, championing championing, uh, mental health and and really trying to, to nourish that side to be healthy um, because like it's it can be so detrimental and damaging and I feel like people are finally coming around to recognizing like oh this might be a problem like (laughs) we should probably take care of that and it's really nice to see some of that stigma being removed from it and that more people are talking about it and people are are okay being like I go to therapy and, you know, I work my shit out and that being a completely normal thing. And it's really kind of, kind of like mind boggling to me that that was never okay to talk about before very much. Like that's a private thing. It's not something that you're supposed to say out in public. So I really do feel that people's attitudes are changing towards this, um, this conversation and this topic. So um, yeah, I'm really hoping there's going to be some longevity with that in the future. Definitely more accessible. There's now a lot of virtual better help, cerebral, a plethora of um, resources that allow you to get therapy right from the privacy of your home. Um, however, here to say yes, but I'm worried that it's become too much of a hype type of thing. Mm-hmm. Like, especially with this generation to come, it's kind of like, oh, I have a therapist and it's so cool, which is a great way to normalize it, at least get conversations going. But I don't want um, it to lose its power as a result, if that makes sense. Like mm-hmm. watered down and even from the therapists and, you know, we're, we're booked and double booked, which is great. And like everybody wants to be seen. But I hope that doesn't affect the work or, you know, lead us to be fatigued or burnt out and not being a service mm-hmm. um, compared to how it was in the past where you had at least, you know, a, a doable caseload. Whereas now, you know, we're, we're kind of worn thin. So it's an interesting time. I I think I get what you're trying to say, what you were saying as far as, um, like it being more of a, of a, it's like, you know, having a Louis Vuitton bag, you know, carrying it around, but (laughs) not necessarily doing the work, you know, Yes. Yes. really like get to the root of, of your issues. Yeah, because um, the clients who I've noticed that are like that of the younger generations, it's they show up and expect me to do the work. And it's like, no, you want a therapist and you want to see me. So, you know, there has to be a give and take here. You know, you're not just coming to see me just to say you're seeing me. Now that you guys are grown, um, how do you think, how does your personal attitude regarding mental health measure up to the values that you were taught growing up? Um, Do you think that they're a departure from, you know, what you saw uh, modeled by your parents as well as what you were raised by? Oh yeah, definitely. I I, I would definitely say there's a departure with that. Like the attitude, especially when it comes to work and working, um, the attitude that my parents really kind of instilled in me when I was young is like work, work, work really hard. Um, Even if you're unhappy at a job, just stay, you know, stay for a couple of years, you know, get that on your resume and stuff like that. Um, As opposed to now, I definitely view that differently and and try to um, kind of identify points where I am not feeling like this is a good environment to be in and really kind of being more hypercritical about the environment I'm being in also like how much stress I'm taking in and when I really need to start taking a break and really start to address that as opposed to me just like going super hard the entire time getting burnt out then getting like physically sick because I am so tired so really trying to recognize, um, these like telltale signs now that I, that are, um, a lot more apparent to me now than before back then when things were really blurred, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, it's definitely changed my attitudes and something I continue to 
kind of uh, exercise um, as I continue to grow? Yeah. So uh, being a lot more proactive versus reactive. Active. Exactly. Handling the stress. I'm sorry, my baby girl is screaming out the top of uh, her head. <laughs> Do you have some help over there? Uh, no, no worries. Um, and I think that's an example of how it does differ. <laughs> I think um, my mom and the generations before um, would have probably taken care of that and kind of put their role as a mother above all things. Um, and it's difficult to say this, but I want to let mamas know that you can do both. You can still have the career. You could still balance. It's not going to be easy, you know, be mama. But um, I think that's a major shift within the generations there. You know, there's not that, not you know, nothing against stay-at-home moms or anything, but you're seeing less of that and more of mamas trying to do it all. Mm-hmm. To say they definitely can. Um, but with mental health, you know, that comes with boundaries, that comes with knowing when I need a break, that comes with asking for help. A lot of things that I didn't grow up with. Can y'all hear it? Oh, it's okay. Oh man, I remember those days. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you. You're doing great. <laughs> Thank you. At least I know it gets better, hopefully. It does. It does. Yeah. Whenever you're trying to even talk about what's going on in your life and how you're handling things, how has your family received your beliefs about uh, self-care, work-life balance, you know, all of the things regarding positive mental health? Oh, well, I think that at least my mom, because I'm a lot closer to my mom, she really likes and appreciates that I'm trying to take more breaks for myself um, because she has witnessed myself burning out one too many times. And whenever she sees me, the first thing she always says is you work too much. You work too much. <laughs> <laughs> so I think she's really like enjoying t- the, the fact that I am taking more breaks and taking more time for myself and for self-care. I think she is really proud of me for doing that and that I'm in a space and that I am privileged enough to take breaks and to be in that position. So it's nice for her to kind of see that. And of course, for me, trying every day, trying to educate her better on this topic and and she's doing a great job too. So has she picked up on some of the things that maybe you've taught her or that she's seen you doing? Yeah, we go to the spa sometimes together, which is really nice. And like she just, she never does that kind of stuff ever. So it's really nice for her to just really indulge and just, you know, take it all in as well. And for her to enjoy that, because then she never did, did stuff like that when she was working or when she had us as well. So it's really nice for, for her to kind of, you know, piggyback on me and also just see what this is like and that this is okay. Showing her a different way. I love it. Which is interesting how it comes full circle because the older I become, the more, you know, my mom is, I guess she witnessed 30 years of my existence and is wondering, okay, something's working. Everything I'm saying, you know, she disregarded or she rebelled against. And now, you know, I'm living unapologetically authentically, you know, answering to no one, but my own, you know, higher self. So it's a lot of room now, finally, for open conversations and, you know, just a safe space to do so. Um, But it took, (laughs) it took, you know, a lot of, a lot of turmoil, (laughs) a lot of disagreements, a lot of ups and downs. But um, I think showing is better than telling sometimes and just kind of living the life that you're speaking, all the back the back and forth and the disagreement and arguments were clearly not as um, successful as just showing her like, this is how I'm living, you know, not even giving a why or justification or going back and forth on that, but just living it, letting her witness it. And finally, we're at a place where she's like, okay, what are you doing? <laughs> what, what is it? What is the secret? 
it's working for you. It seems like a lot of times I think our parents, even when we're older, they just want to know we're okay. Like that gives them the peace, whatever peace they need. But Mm -hmm. also to a degree, I have a suspicion too that it's like, you're a reflection of how well they did as a parent. (laughs) I'm sorry, I'm going to have to hop off. Oh. Maybe I'm so sorry. It's okay. No, thank you so much for joining us, Devin. All right. <laughs> oh. oh, I remember that. So you're good for those days. Hey. I also would rather forget. <laughs> to talk about mental health. Yeah, that's a that's a tough time. Um yeah, yeah but you know, like I was saying, just I think a lot of, a lot of times, like our parents just think, well, you know, if you're doing good, then, then they're good. And, and if if your if your life is going in a, in a positive direction as they perceive it, then they think, okay, well, I must've done something right as a parent. (laughs) Just to wrap it up then, um, you know, especially with the impending holidays, if there are situations where, we we're going to come across some some things that we just disagree with what's the best way to um, approach these conversations I mean yeah that's it's hard I, I again like anytime I have been presented any kind of challenging question um, I really try to like actively listen to what they're trying to say and not just thinking about dismissing them because I, I want them to feel like they're heard too yeah. <laughs> give them the time of day but then also like I'm also happy to disagree and that's totally fine because I know like with any kind of like yeah was was American Thanksgiving coming up and then the holidays we have a lot of different political views and a lot of feelings and very expressive family members and stuff yeah. too, <laughs> which can be tricky to navigate but you also have to like pick and choose your battles too in terms of like is this really worth my energy? Same, same. (laughs) (laughs) And it's like just also a form of self-preservation sometimes where it's like, okay, I'm just going to accept that these are your beliefs and these are mine and that's okay. We don't necessarily need to be on the same page all the time. Do you have any like special customs or traditions typically that you do with your family during the holidays? I forgot to ask that at the beginning. Oh, that's okay. I mean, food, there's always, everything centered around a big meal. Yeah. No if it's a holiday or not, there's always a big meal and some kind of like, you know, alcohol that's flowing on our tables that just never seems to end. So Is that the Filipino side in your oh, family? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you know, right? It is extravagant like the just like pans of you know like the tinfoil pan yes, the aluminum like, <laughs> yeah or yeah the aluminum <laughs> pans of just like yeah food like a freaking buffet of food and it's like yeah. there's only five of us here like why do we need this much food <laughs> there's like enough food for 20 and then like my dad's so good that he actually like buys all these Tupperwares and and sends us home with a ton of food. (laughs) The to-go boxes and like the plastic bags. No, my aunt is who usually hosts and she has like the whole setup ready to go and you have to take the food away with you. Otherwise she is offended. Well, um, I appreciate you for being just vulnerable and open and sharing during this conversation. And, you know, thank you, even though she had to leave, but thank you to Devin as well for, you know, taking the time and sharing. And hopefully, you know, um, I know this is probably like several long conversations if we were really to to really you know get into the meat of this but at the same time hopefully people have perspective too that you know the struggles that we have with our family sometimes you know you're not alone and (laughs) and just keep evolving (laughs) yeah (laughs) if people wanted to follow you and see also learn more about a stripped by sia podcast um, where can they go to find out more about that? 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, Stripped by CM, my podcast is available on all major um, streaming platforms. So like Apple, Spotify, pretty much everything that's out there. If, yeah, it's pretty much available anywhere you go. And um, if you do want to contact me directly, you can reach out to me on Twitter at Stripped by Sia and also on Instagram. I'm there as well with the same handle, Stripped by Sia. And then for the full catalog list of episodes, Stripped by Sia.com. Well, thank you so much, Vanessa. This is such a great conversation and really great to just dive deeper and just kind of like talk about this more because there's never enough conversations around the topic of mental health. So thank you so much for the opportunity and allowing me to be vulnerable in this safe space. So it's, it's appreciated. Thank you. Amazing. <laughs> so much.